Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Craig Campabella. I am setting in for the illustrious Stephen Wong because he can't be here in his usual seat tonight because he's in that seat being interviewed tonight. This is old crap. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Man. Good to see you. You've been asking for this for some time, actually. Well, yeah. you know, we had to get we had to get an interview of you and uh, and your lovely wife. So, uh, what better time than the present to do Absolutely. that? Absolutely, right after the 2015 <clears throat> Montes. Yeah. So you're you are one of the producers. You are a co-producer, right? You know what? I had a uh, a person come into the theater. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, and they're looking around. They go. So what are you? <laughs> well, I know you do everything, but yeah. one of the titles but is... But basically, the, uh, and I told them, you know what? It doesn't matter. At the time, I might have been president, uh, but I said, you know what? All that means is I take the garbage out, or maybe if I'm vice president, I get to say, you take it out or I take it out. It really does. You know what? You know how it is. You, you wear the hats. I, ha I um, it's, I'm, you know, I'm founder, uh, now business manager, uh, I write newsletters. We edit, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, move stuff backstage, set lights, whatever, audio. It's whatever needs to be done. Let's start this again because you kind of ruined my bit. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, we'll start again. Yeah. Are you one of the producers around here? Sure. Okay, I yes. want you to pick one of these scarves because that shirt ain't cutting it if you're a producer. So let's... Uh, you want... Let's, uh, oh, we're, not, we're, going to, we're going to have... Uh, now, See? more Fellini-esque. More Fellini-esque. Oh, yeah. yes. That could be crazy. That could be crazy. Does that feel better? Uh, sure. What the heck? From it's Fellini. Or would you like the gray? Or would you like the gray? What am I going to do with the gray? No, no. You head. have your choice. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> this is fine. That works good with <laughs> this. It. Works okay. Good. All right. Then we'll. Uh, you look Fellini yeah, nah, Fellini-esque. Just very, just very casual. Yeah. There you go. I saw a lot of that in Italy. You know what? This was the the easiest way to dress up. Uh, Absolutely it is. And uh, you were the man that when my wife and I went to Italy for the first time, pounded into my brain. <laughs> Try the gelato. Try the gelato. And uh, when we first got to Rome that very first night, somewhere up above I heard the wild man's voice. Try the gelato. And we did. <laughs> <laughs> and we tried it two or three times a day. <laughs> two or three next, times a day? For the next... A day? A day. Morning, <laughs> noon, and night. Oh my I had goodness. some... Well, I didn't get a big bowl No, no, it. no. I just got a little bitty. Yeah. Sure. See, if you get little ones, you can have it three times a day. Sure. Those great big ones, I don't see how anybody could do that. I had a seven scoop one that someone managed to sell me, you know, and it was all fruit. And I hate fruit. You're a type and, and it a gelato was, eater. And it was wonderful. Yeah. Let's start back to the little bitty baby. Baby? Little Don't baby remember that part. Stephen Wong. Baby. Where, 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 where was he first taken home at? That's a good question. I'm born in Oklahoma. I'm an Okie. So I was born in Oklahoma. But uh, being an oil brat, that's what you call us when, when your dad works in the oil field. Uh, at age three, we left for Venezuela. So the little bitty baby Stephen Wong moves in to a home in Tulsa, Oklahoma, remains there for three years, and then goes to Venezuela. Venezuela. Goes to Venezuela. Why? That's because dad was offered a two-year stint that turned into an eight-year stint. That's funny how, how that happens. Yeah, isn't that yeah. amazing how that happened? So he goes on there. Of course, I don't remember much. I think the first thing I remember was probably like at five or six. And sure. I'm in a trailer home there. It, uh, and... Yeah, hey, I didn't know any different. Hey, it was good. Then we moved up to a different home. They're all company owned. Right. Uh, and I remember my uh, dad's boss coming over for, for dinner every now and then. He would fly in from the States, come, come and, and see us. And he became to, uh, be almost family in that mm -hmm. sense because we go visit him and go to Colorado and things right. like that. So those are my first memories of growing up. So you didn't stay for eight years straight in Venezuela. You did come back to the U.S. We eventually visit. came back, yes. But right. when I came back at, at age 12... That was strange because that's the only place I really ever knew, sure. consciously. And uh, that was traumatic. I didn't want to leave. Where in Venezuela? It's uh, about an hour out of Maracaibo. So there's not really a town there. It's, it's a company town. When I say a company town, it's got a bunch of, you know, the same looking type homes that have been pressed out and repeated over and over again mm -hmm. with a fence around it and a few guards. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. And 
oil nothing camp. special about it. It's an oil town. Yeah, oil and it's an oil camp. There's nothing special about it, but okay. it was home. So you came from a nondescript, nothing special about it town in Venezuela. Right. Back to the United States. That was and traumatic. where did where did little Steve land at that point? Because Dad's looking for a job. It's seventy two. He ends up in Dallas. So that's we ended up in Dallas. And the mm-hmm. first thing I remember about a Dallas is a Bex Charburger. I don't even think they're around anymore. But man, that was the best burger. Oh, oh yeah. We would have it one every day. One every, every day, day because it was that good. You know, not just any burger. And, and you have to understand, I'm used to really good burgers. Okay, now, I'm not a big burger fan, but a really good burgers. And we would have a, uh, we had a friend that would take hamburger meat and make it about as thin, paper thin as you could make it. Mm-hmm. Put it on foil and then, then stick it on a charcoal grill. Mm-hmm. And it would just take in that flavor. And mm-hmm. It was awesome. And this was pretty good. So, right. yeah, Bex, yeah, Bex did a good Bex, but you don't burger. know they exist anymore. I doubt they exist. So anymore. you come back, you have a great hamburger. You have right. it almost every day. Then what happens, Steve? Well, then we get stuck in some town, Irving, Texas. Irving. And we're like, oh, Dad, what, you know, but you know how it is. You, you where know. the stadium is. Yeah. yeah, well, at that time, yes, there was a stadium there. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't know anything about the place. You know, it's, you know you're, you're a typical kid. You're mad at your parents because mm-hmm. they've moved you away from what you know. Sure. And yeah, you're now, having you know, to readjust. You have to readjust. Uh and, it, and it's different. I mean, I'm used to classes of 12 people. It's a private school. Now, all of a sudden, you're in public school. You've got 30-plus kids in there. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not well-behaved. It's tough. It's different. It's different. Mm-hmm. So... You made your way through high school. You make your way through high school. What were you dreaming of during high school? What is little Steve thinking? I'm think going to be... A thing. I think I wanted to... You, you don't know anything when you're a kid. So you, you take oh, on I other did. people's I values. I knew exactly what I wanted to be. So you, you well, that's, that, say that. That's, good. that's nice that you knew. I wanted to be an astronaut. Well, I mean, I can make up all kinds of stuff I, you know, that you think you want to be. You okay. think you want to be president. You think you want to, you know, whatever. So did you think those things? Uh, of course I did. Okay. Didn't mean, didn't mean okay. anything to me. As you're moving towards 18, you should be getting a little more serious, but you weren't. You had no idea. I had no idea where I wanted to go. And so, so what happened? You start listening to your friends, right? Well, right. of course. Your friends tell you, oh, I like A&M. Oh, I like Princeton. Oh, I like whatever. You and, should be uh, an engineer. Nobody actually said that, but that's kind of interesting. But, you know, everybody says, most of you think about where, which is usually where your friends are going. Sure. Uh, I wanted to get away. Now, Mm -hmm. when I was in high school, I was known, let's put it that way. Um, And I wanted to go to a place where nobody knew me so Mm -hmm. I could start over again. Sure. So I wanted to go out of state. Mm -hmm. Mom says, nope. You can go anywhere you want to. It just has to be in Texas. Right. Oh, darn. Okay. I guess Princeton's out. (laughs) So... Uh, which is interesting because had I gone to Princeton, I wouldn't have met Carolyn, who lives in the Princeton area. Everything happens for right. a reason, it seems. Yes, it seems. So that's fine. So I'm looking around at places in uh, in Texas, and the friends said, let's go to this weekend at A&M, because that's where they were going. Mm-hmm. But there, yeah, I kind of liked it. I went to UT as well. That's about that. And so since my friends were going to A&M, I thought, well, what the heck, I'll, I'll go there. And, and you out, signed up for the basics. Uh, I signed up for the basics, but nobody went there. They all flunked out or whatever. They started there but couldn't make it. That's right. And, and so, you wound up alone. Uh, by myself. Actually, that first year, I hardly knew anyone. So your yeah. dream kind of came true, or you were alone. In, in that sense, no yes. In that sense, you kind of wish you that's what you want. But, but in fact, it helped to know a few people. So, yeah, there sure. are maybe nine people from our high school that actually went there. So right. you knew someone, but not too many. You can exactly. reestablish who you are. You can sure. remake yourself. And I sure. think that's mostly what we wanted. We wanted to remake ourselves into just something mm-hmm. else. That's what we, we're always doing that. But go ahead. No, I, 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 we want to remake ourselves. Part of that had to do with, uh, I think, you know, when we were in high school, people thought of you as a certain way. That was mm-hmm. the age of Animal House. Sure. It's the, you know, and I... You were wild man. I was wild man. And the only reason I was wild man is that they needed to improve my image. So somebody picked that moniker for me, or avatar, and yeah. said, you are now wild man. I said, yeah. okay. <laughs> I rose by any shirt. other name, right? And actually, it's, it's, it's a nice conversation starter. Right. <laughs> yeah, I like, That's how I met you. Yeah. When I came off the street, they thought yeah. I was a homeless man. Yeah. Nothing against homeless people. Yeah. They thought I was a vagrant. Right. And I walked in the back. Mm-hmm. And you were actually the very first person, other than Jim Walker, that I knew. You walked up to me and you go, hi, my name is Wild Man. And I went, what in the hell have I got myself into here? And that's, 
that's how it all started. But I'm glad you were friendly and came up and you said that. So now uh, you work, uh, you're in A&M, you go, uh-oh, I need to pick something to do that I like. How did this happen? Tell me in what it so, was. So in the typical fashion, I, I look around and say, you know what, electrical engineering looks interesting. So I go back uh, home, see my friends, teachers, and I say, I've decided to be an electrical engineer. And they all said, wrong answer. They all did. There wasn't a single one who said anything Isn't that nice when everybody gets excited for an original <laughs> idea? <that you> <laughs> yeah, that's my, sorry, wrong answer. No, you need to be a petroleum engineer. Okay. What? Because that, that's what was hot at the well, time. Sure, yeah. So, so the wild it, man goes. The wild man goes, uh, I guess I'll do that. But I'm going to do it my way. So I ended up becoming a petroleum engineer, but I wanted to study things that most petroleum engineers don't study. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I did. Which, so I, and that was my way of rebelling, okay? That was sure. my way of rebelling, but within the parameters of, I'm paying for your school, so hey, guess what? there's a little bit of wild man and ever petroleum engineer. <laughs> that's right. That needs right, a place yeah. to come out. Right. Right, and you found it. So that's what, that's what I ended up doing. And uh, so in 82, jobs are hot. And I'm hearing about sophomores getting eight job offers and more. I said, oh, this is not too bad. Mm-hmm. Next year is my year to come up. Nope. Only half the class gets a job offer. Things are starting to look bad. Always wanted to go to grad school. So what the heck? So I'll go wait to grad this school. one out. I'm going to wait this one out. Four years, five, whatever. I'll do grad school. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, when I did that, that's when we met Carolyn. I guess it was, um, I don't know if it's 84, 85 that she had come down. Uh, she probably told her story of how she had someone who recommended that she come to A and M because they had a mm-hmm. good chemistry program, mm-hmm. and it was cheap at the time. Mm-hmm. So that's what she did. But had I gone to Princeton, I would never have met her. No, you wouldn't have. And the thing that I find most interesting of the wild man inside the petroleum engineer mm-hmm. is uh, uh, your choice of uh, dresses. I, gingham <laughs> is I, when I look at you, I don't think of a gingham dress and a little bonnet. But obviously it was true. This is what your wife said she first saw you in. Have you always been a snappy dresser? No. Uh, in fact, I hate dressing. That's, that's, right. a, uh, that's from uh, being a, a right. kid. Well, what, what makes a man choose a gingham dress over, say, like satin or uh, I think it's just practicality. Okay. We were going to a You costume. wanted a practical dress. I wanted a practical, well, I wanted a practical costume. What kind costume. of shoes did you wear with? That, that's a good question. See, practical costume in the sense that it's a Halloween party. You're supposed right. to dress up. I had nothing to dress up except with. a gingham dress in the closet. No, actually, there were there were the the, the lady that I was staying with it was like uh-huh. an 80 year old lady in Bryan, Texas. Right. She had, had this stuff. Says here, can you wear this? Okay, all I need is a bonnet. So I went and looked up for a bonnet, and that was it. Did you have a character that you were trying? Or Absolutely you not. You know what? Not. I wasn't the only just... one that was in drag. In fact, there were other people. <laughs> I wasn't going to say drag, <laughs> but you know that's you know um, no. So there were uh, that's that's how. And Carolyn, did she tell you what she was dressed up in? Uh, no, she didn't. She left that. Do you remember out. Carol Burnett? At the oh end yes, of the no, show? she did tell me that. That's yeah. how she looked yes. with the mop and the bucket. Absolutely, and the absolutely. And that's why I even called her that. That's said, right. It's Carol Burnett. <laughs> yeah, she said that. She, she just happens that. to be Carol as well, right. but yeah. So yeah, so that's how I that's how I thought. Well, you know this that whole thing's a visual. I'll. Never... <laughs> I'm glad there aren't any pictures. I'll there was never, no Facebook back I'll, then. I'll thank never goodness. Forget. Oh, thank thank <laughs> goodness. So, you met Carolyn. Yeah. And, uh, and it took you, what, uh, six months or so to ask her out after that night? Something like that. Yeah, it took a while. Right. Yeah. And uh, then you did, and then things progressed. And then what happened? Well, let's see here. We were both at school. We got married. Right. Well, first, probably where we got graduation, probably graduated first, and then got married. But we were, she went to grad school as well, and then uh, I was in grad school. I mean, I was working on my PhD at the mm-hmm. time. And uh, so the interesting, you know, when you're, when you're at college, of course, everyone studies a lot. Well, otherwise, you don't, you don't remain very long if you're not. And I remember coming home at midnight one time, and she's not there call her up on the phone. Where the hell are you? She goes, I'm working on set. Which we probably just about 2.30 in the morning. Sure. Which basically meant I was a theater widow. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to see my wife, more, I had to join study the theater. Time. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's more study time where I'm going to join my wife. And that's really how I got back into theater. I did it when I was smaller, but I really, 
uh, got out because it's busy. Yeah. Well, it's not that it, it's just, I didn't have the time. Didn't I really didn't have the time. Have the time. But as we were starting to get closer to graduation, yeah, you know, you start looking for other interests because that's kind of interesting. You know, when you leave college, were you both passionate about it, or was one more passionate than the well, other? Well, Carolyn's always more passionate about it. Not, not that I was. I just wasn't. I just didn't have the time. Right. Didn't have the time. I mean, I did it when I was in high school. Sure. Uh, and I even dabbled with when I, if we could get into college, but mm-hmm. really didn't have the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when she started doing it, waiting for me to get out, mm-hmm. then we started getting really more into community theater. What's, what's it mm-hmm. about, and who are who are the big players in that area and that kind of Dallas stuff? Dallas and yeah. all that. And then she told me that you came down forty five. She would not release her bag of fritos <laughs> for about two years, <laughs> and then she eventually mm-hmm. laid down the fritos, brought your son with her, came down here, and then it was you, a price though. And then you two yeah. began working in theater again in your free time. Yeah, so the uh, the whole thing, uh, Carolyn really enjoyed uh, doing theater. Mm-hmm. And so when we were in the Dallas area, we were, you know we didn't have Michael at the time. Mm-hmm. And you go through the usual thing that couples do is, when's the right time to have kids? If sure. you're going to have kids. Right. Well, it never seems to be the right time to have kids. If you're no, thinking about that, you'll, you'll never, it'll never be the right time. Right. So it's about eight years going, she's doing a play. And this particular play explores that very question. Is it right? Is it not right? Or whatever. Just kind of, kind mm-hmm. of interesting. It was about that time. Also about that time, uh, jobs weren't, at least in the oil industry, was, wasn't that strong. So we were doing whatever we, we could. Mm-hmm. One of my assignments took to Alaska, which means it took me away from her for a long time. Mm-hmm. So you know how that goes. When you're away from your spouse for, for long stretches of time, things happen, mm-hmm. let's just say. And so she wanted to go to Alaska one time. And she says, you know, you're always going up there. I want to see what this place is like. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Uh, so I went up there on one of my trips. She meets me on a, a long weekend, probably Labor Day weekend. And I look like Mountain Man, if I can look that way. So, and. You already you know, had the name. <laughs> had the name, uh, you know, looked pretty scraggly, right you know. So, right. um, and then Michael was born. So. <laughs> So, so the wild man <laughs> in all of his glory. All right, well, that's real interesting. That one, so, so, but uh, yeah, yeah, she she didn't do theater for for a while. Partly because I was commuting, and then part, of course, when you when you have small kids, it makes it really hard mm-hmm. uh, for v- various reasons. One, you sure. don't have the energy, and right. then two, then you've got to find the arrangements. You know, who's going to babysit? It's who's gonna, very yeah. difficult. The people yeah. that that that's what one of the things I love about community theater is you know people they bring their kids and they have grandma or whatever sitting back there on the back row watching them while yep. mom and dad are in. it's really it's, it's or sometimes it's, they're in the play yeah. <laughs> sometimes, right. so you're down here and you start uh, one little thing after another uh and uh, you start getting into into theater around here and uh, uh your wife told me about what she thought the first time she walked into this crown jewel mm-hmm. what was your thought you know we've done community theater and seeing community theater in a lot of places mm-hmm. And when we came into the Crichton, we, we couldn't believe it. We said, this can't be a community theater place. It's too big. It's too nice. Oh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like anything else. It, it, it needs uh, a lot of TLC. But people that act on the stage are on the stage, and many famous people have acted on the same stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity. It's an incredible gift. It's, you know... Um, it's incredible. It's just to, to be, to stand on the mm-hmm. stage that other people have been on. Again, because we've done stuff in, in place. Well, you know what? You've done stuff in Dallas, you know, like Theater 3, you know, the basement. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, there's strip malls. There's nothing against that. I mean, it's a place to practice your craft and to entertain people. Nothing wrong with that. Tell the story. But when you're here and then you go someplace else, you get spoiled. Oh, And you so forget, and you forget what it was yeah. like uh, to fight your way. Right. To a relatively nice place. Yeah. Now, it's just, yeah. There, there's a lot of things that this place needs. Uh, uh, absolutely. But into the, into the history, I mean, you can be in much larger places than this. Mm-hmm. You can be in much smaller places. But the, the history of a place, especially for the U.S., where 80 years old is a lot. Like, in Europe, that's nothing. In Europe, it's nothing. But it's here, hard to put 500 people in your living room yes. for an intimate concert or poetry reading or whatever. You can do that in Obsidian. But you can yes. do it right here. Yes, you can. Yes, this you can. is like your five, 500 yes. people in your living room. So you're moving, you're coming along and then uh, uh, 
you start stage right, things, uh, you know, you have all the growing pains that any organization has, and then seven, eight years later, you have this season that a Christmas play yeah, broke tops all the records. your records, yep. and you're scratching your head, and then singing in the rain breaks that record, breaks that record, and then Shrek breaks that record, breaks not only that record, but all the records in front of it. Right. What went on through your mind well, as these records were being set? I think when you're in, when you're in it deep in the, the creative process. You don't generally think about, ooh, I'm going to break the record, or ooh, what does this feel like? Because to me, it's all one eight-year ride. It's an eight-year ride that, that started with a very simple question. I see a wrong, what am I going to do about it? Mm -hmm. As a person, pretty much for most of my life, I've been bullied. Mm -hmm. That's just that's the way things are. And because of that, I've tended to do whatever it takes to get along. Uh, mm -hmm. Get people to like you, okay, whatever, okay, if that's what it takes, okay, fine, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Just simply acquiesce. Mm -hmm. At some point in everyone's life, you have to decide whether or not... You want to stand up for whatever. Are you going to stand for something? Or for yourself? Are you going to stand up for yourself? Are you going to stand for something? After, at the end of your life, did, did you make a difference? Mm -hmm. Did I just simply give up, say, okay, I'm just going to go along with the crowd, or mm -hmm. am I going to do something about mm -hmm. it? And they just happened to catch me at a time where I just said, I'm going to do something about it. Right. I could have very, any other time in my life, I could have just easily said, it's not my fight, not my battle, don't care. Uh, you know, I, you not, know yeah. I don't want to put make waves. I not my still, monkeys, not my circus. No, yeah. Exactly. Right. They just happened to catch me at that particular time. Said, right. No, I'm well, going to make a Well, you know, that's, that's the look. Creative differences are part of the creative process. And uh, there's uh, when you have three record-breaking shows in one season... That doesn't mean you're doing the wrong right. things. My question to you was, was there any satisfaction in that? I understand about the fog of war. Right. I understand about being there as it's all happening. Sure. But is, was there any sense of satisfaction? That's very unusual for three shows oh, no, to set a, records absolutely. one after another. No, absolutely. In fact, we weren't even thinking that way. It just happened. Christmas. That's my point. When I when I say when I say the Christmas show, I, people tell me, "Oh, best Christmas pageant ever! You you you, you got to do this show." I'm like, "What is so special about this show? I've never mm -hmm. seen it before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard things about it, mm -hmm. uh, but even still, even though it was well executed and all that kind of stuff, there's still this magic that occurs when you connect with not just the audience that's there, and then they tell everyone, and 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 it and keeps building." Mm -hmm. There, there's, there's, there's magic there, and especially for us at, at Christmas time. I have a lot of friends that refuse to do a show at Christmas time, mm -hmm. and they say ah, it's just too much work. And I tell them there is nothing like giving the gift of laughter mm -hmm. and sometimes tears to 500 of your closest friends in one performance. Right. Nothing like it, and right. we did it for 3,700 people. I think you might be able to run for governor because you still haven't <laughs> a answered my question, and I'm not going to let you go. Did you feel, after all of those years, because what you've been doing is not easy, mm -hmm. did you feel a little bit of satisfaction that we worked and built an audience and that these shows in this one year started breaking it? It's just, yeah, for, of course you did, right? For a moment. But I'll tell you what is more meaningful than breaking a record. Or something. Don't get me wrong. You, you jump up and down and say, this is great. Okay. More meaningful are the times when you're just tired. And you're ready to give up. Mm -hmm. And somebody comes along with a story. Mm -hmm. And they tell you, I want to tell you what you did for me. Nothing like it. This particular story is just one of many that we've heard. So this, this particular story is a lady. Used to be a theater teacher. Uh, she's just moved to a retirement center. She's kind of thinking this is kind of the end of her life. Doesn't really know what to make of it. She doesn't know what's left. Sure. Or is there any worth? Is it worth living? Mm -hmm. She comes to see a comedy of ours. I think it was mm -hmm. Southern Hospitality. It doesn't really matter which one it was. Mm -hmm. And enjoyed it so much that she went back to the theater community and started writing plays. Mm -hmm. Started organizing shows at the center. Bringing groups to here. She found a new meaning to life. And when I heard that, mm -hmm. it made me feel, I am so selfish. Because here all these times, you know, you, you do whatever it is you do, but you just get tired and collect. Kind of like, is it really worth it? And then someone tells you a story like that that mm -hmm. completely changes their life. 
Yeah, and you realize it doesn't happen in yes. it doesn't happen in accounting or petroleum no. engineering very no. often. It doesn't happen in the hallowed halls of law. No. But in the spirit world, which is where the arts live, mm -hmm. you know, all of that is terrestrial. Right. You touch it, feel it, coins, trees, land, earth that we walk and live on. But what we do is the wind. Mm -hmm. And it blows around. You can't survive without it, but you can't see it. You don't know where it comes from. Right. You don't know where it's going to go and all that stuff and, and who it'll touch. What blows over you may touch oh, somebody impact. down the road, the impact that it would have. And that's why it's, one, so hard to describe. That's one, why it brings tears. That's two, why it changes people's lives. And uh, you, sir, uh, have stuck with your vision and... Uh, and it being a success is absolutely nothing to be ashamed about. There's nope. twice as many people now that get to work on uh, offerings around here. That including all the way from technical to actors, actresses, directors, and audiences. And both theaters have been full. Mm -hmm. So nothing both have done well. No, and both and both and both have done well. And I think that uh, probably during the Montes the other night, everybody was uh, beginning to realize. That we really do need each other, mm -hmm. right? And that's yes. a, and that's a and that's a good thing, and it'll continue to grow. Uh, as an actor, what's your favorite kind of role to play? Okay, well, first of all, I can't remember anything, so I so think one without lines. That in saying? fact, that was one of the first things that in, in Mash when uh, uh, I met you for the first time in Mash. in Mash. Yeah, in fact, so I auditioned and. Really, this is why we also like to do community theater. We did it as a family thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a summer thing. Carolyn's there. Michael's here. I'm here. Let's just do it as family. Mm -hmm. So we all auditioned. Jim Walker calls me up and says, I'd like to give you the role of private so-and-so, whatever. I actually had a few lines. Thought about it for all of them. I don't know, five seconds said, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. But I'd really prefer one without lines. Mm -hmm. Not so much that I don't think I could do the lines, <laughs> I was there to enjoy the time just being with family. Sure. Yeah, you know, Carolyn had maybe all of eight lines. Mm -hmm. Michael and I, I don't think, had any lines. Pretty much we were just, you know, like set pieces moving around. But it was mm -hmm. fun. It, it was a fun a fun thing to do. We joke about, we got we got to play every ethnicity except Chinese until recently. And anything goes. We were Korean in that. So, right. <laughs> so I actually learned some Korean. Not that anybody would know, but yeah. I learned some Korean just so I could say, okay. But you yeah. knew. But I knew. Yeah. And so, yeah, so part, you know what, the, the part that I would like to do, uh, oh, guys, there's so many parts. I'd love to be the comedian, like the, the, the narrator in Drowsy Chaperone. I'd love to be, you know, like the Gene Kelly part, you know, that can dance and sing and sweep somebody off their, their feet. No, I enjoy dancing, but I'm not going to be doing any of those kind of things right. that he does. Uh, What's your no, most favorite role that you've ever done? The most favorite role? I really, um, Really haven't thought that. I think well, the South Pacific. They're all the same. South Pacific. No, they're not. Actually, it was in South Pacific. I was the captain of South Pacific. That probably was the largest part I'd done today. But, but the really, uh, if I could do more and do more lines, yeah, probably would. But I'm, I'm not really that good at lines. So, <laughs> and in any case, you know, I think it's it's interesting to to be the, the character anyway. The character Out of all parts. the different parts in the theater, yeah. producer, director, actor, set builder. If yeah. you had to choose one job, oh my goodness! I uh, know, but we got to do it. You got to pick yeah. one. You got to, yeah. This is just an exercise. Yes. Tonight. Yeah. Steve, you can only do one job from here on out in the field. Do I get to do it once? No, you have to do it from here on out till we fire you. I'd love to sing. Yeah, I'd love to sing. I'm, I'm, try I'm holding it all in right now. You want? You would like to be a singer in a musical? Oh yeah. Well, I've already done that. But if you had to pick one thing, I think one thing, sing. and the reason for now, I'm talking yeah. to, let's yeah, look. Yeah, yeah. When you say sing, are you talking about like standing on the stage by yourself with a microphone and sing like Sinatra? Or are you talking about being in musicals, which is what I'm I'm thinking talking more about. of thinking musical because it's more okay. usually thinking musical. So comedy. you'd like a big yeah. role. You'd like to be the main yeah. guy sure. or the supporting guy. the main guy. Sure. In the sure. musicals. Yeah. You know what? That sounds like just the opposite of everything you've just told me. <laughs> That's just like the weirdest thing. I would have lost a lot of money on that. And I understand the gang of dress a little bit better, too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding with you. No. So, if you were an herb. <laughs> an herb. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. 
you were an herb, yep. what, would what I be? kind of herb would you be? Arugula. And why? He said arugula. Yeah, very specific, yes. Yeah, why? Uh, arugula has a nice uh, pungent taste, but it has to coexist with fire ants, which is kind of amazing. It doesn't have to, but it manages to. So here we talk about the scourge of the earth, like the fire ants, that's what I think of. And yet, if you go to arugula plants, there are fire ants all over it. Mm-hmm. But the arugula thrives because it likes the acidic soil. That's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife. <laughs> but hey, yeah, it's you being an herb. What am I, I, I saying? That's right. Right. So what's your herb? Right. I'm doing this at questions here. <laughs> your <laughs> wife wanted to be a basil. She said basil. she was basil. Yeah. Okay. Fragrant. Sure. Right. Tasty. Best one that's fresh. Great. Absolutely. Best one's fresh. Great on the Great on pizza. Um, being an actor, I, uh, your wife, you know, she picked up best actress of the year in a comedy or drama this year. Yeah, we were we were shocked. We and, were shocked. Uh, well, I wasn't. She was phenomenal. She played against her type, and yeah, and it's, it's it's not so much it that. Part. I, I know Carolyn's a good actress. Okay, I mean, I mean, her her greatest champion, uh, and I've always got tips for her mm-hmm. when I see something that isn't right. Usually, it has to do with truthfulness, mm-hmm. because I'm a like a, a lot of people. Or like Dennis O'Connor, three chords um, in the truth. No, it's actually it's it's about observation. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at something and it doesn't feel right, there's probably something about it that isn't mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. True in acting, true in a lot of things, mm-hmm. and that's what I tell. Them. But no, so I know she she would do fine if she gives the role. She's going to give it her all. I know she's going to do fine. Mm-hmm. But we had so many fine actresses that gave incredible performances here. I just couldn't see how she was going to win. Really, I mean, I know she, she's fine. Deserving, absolutely. But there were so many others that did such an incredible job this year. Yeah. What, 40, 60, I don't know how many people. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a clue. Well, congratulations to her, and congratulations on you and all your success. What I was trying to get to just a moment ago is you being an actor, your wife being an actor, coming from now an acting family and a a pretty well-known theater family. Uh, How important do you think being able to improvise is absolutely it's very important and uh it's probably one of the the best skills that you was it's doing oh it's yeah he's gonna leave me so i get to answer this question it's probably one of the best things that you can learn to do in your life not because it has anything to do with the stage it's something you have to do in your business you got 30 seconds go improvise oh cats man i'm I'm gonna get on stage you know who the was really good at this Robin Williams. I didn't, I'm not talking to him. I know. You're not talking to Robin Williams because he Let's, could do so much with a scar. He could do so much with um, uh, characters and his voice. And right. it, it, it's just, you know, it, 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 it's, it's just amazing what you could do with this, uh, this silly thing, you know? Um, it, yeah, it's. A, I'm telling you, improvisation is is a wonderful thing. I wish I were better. At I'll show you what your wife did. She goes, she goes like this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> she turns it into a mic. Thank you, Stephen Wong. <laughs> thank you for being with us tonight. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, give me a microphone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My name is like this. Right. Looks like a chess piece. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>